evening to all of you. Thank you, Tim. It's uh, an honor to be here with you to share some thoughts about uh, the mission, the object, the work of the Theosophical Society. Uh, for most of you who are here, you're familiar with the work of the Theosophical Society. Um, but for those who are new, it shares a common vision about a better world, a, a better life for the individual, a life of harmony and the absence of conflicts and warfare and mutual suspiciousness among peoples of the world. Now, the Theosophical Society has been around for more than 130 years. And during these 130 years, it has taken root in world thought. It had done a lot of things um, in transforming the way people look at not only life, but also at society, nature, and the universe. So after 130 years, we have to look forward and then see in what way can these lofty thoughts um, have greater influence on society in general? And what is it that we, not only just members of the Theosophical Society, but those who are in sympathy uh, towards these objectives, what we can do in order to further such goals? Now, if we start with very general things, like the problems of life, we will notice that there are two main things that we, uh, that we encounter when it comes to problems in living. The first would be individual sorrow, my pain, your pain, um, the things that make us individuals unhappy. And the second would be social conflicts, which brings about bring about also pains to masses of people, including the individual. And the ageless wisdom, which is a general term for what theosophy represents, because the ageless wisdom can be found not only in, the, in this uh, body of thought called theosophy, but in many other movements. The ageless wisdom many of us are convinced, contain the elements which will bring about the resolution of these problems of individual sorrow as well as social conflict. It has the solution to both. It asks of individuals to undergo basic transformation, and it is when individuals are transformed that society's problems are also transformed. It cannot be otherwise. When we just enact laws or create structures or put up police forces or military personnel to solve social problems, but we don't change individuals, ourselves, then those structures will come to nothing. But when individuals are transformed, then even with minimal laws or policies or guidelines, then we will find that we are naturally harmonious with each other. Uh, in my work in the Theosophical Society, I've started um, in the usual idealistic uh, way by trying to undertake programs rather aggressively in order to try to do something uh, for society to change somewhat. And through the years, I realized that without inner change, these outward changes will not take real effect, will not re really take root. And even if we have a perfect constitution or perfect laws, there is always somebody who can violate those or go against them when the intention is there. But without laws, when there is compassion, benevolence, kindness, understanding, then people just don't go about harming other people. And hence, the root of social, the resolution of social problems lies in individual change. 
Now, there is a letter, a famous letter in the theosophical literature, which contains uh, a very challenging thought. Uh, it is written by a great teacher, a teacher of teachers. He's just called the Ma Chohan, or the Great Chohan. And it says this, to be true, religion and philosophy must offer the solution of every problem. That the world is in such a bad condition morally is a conclusive evidence that none of its religions and philosophies, those of the civilized races less than any other, have ever possessed the truth. To these, there must be somewhere a consistent solution. And if our doctrines will show their competencies to offer it, then the world will be the first one to confess that that must be the true philosophy, the true religion, the true light, which gives truth and nothing but the truth. A very strong statement and which challenges us. If there is something that we espouse, whether it is theosophy or Christianity or Hinduism, whatever it is, then it must undergo the test of its practicability, its ability to solve first individual problems and then social issues. And we in the Theosophical Society, especially those who have been with the Society for a long time, decades, 20 years, 40 years, have been convinced that we do have, there is indeed such an ageless wisdom that has the key to the resolution of these inner individual problems and social problems. But just because there, there is a key, it doesn't mean that the solutions will immediately be attained now. Because again, it depends upon masses of people, not just one individual, even if we have a, a perfect person in our midst, but the rest of us are still self-centered and selfish. Then society, which means all the group consisting of all of us, will still be conflict-ridden, uh, problem-ridden, because it needs all of us to attain to such a state of inward resolution, inward harmony, before we can attain to a social state of harmony. So, if theosophy, the ageless wisdom, possesses the key to such, then it behooves us, those who are sympathetic to this view, who have tested this view, that we do something in order to make it a part of the influence in society, to make the society a better place. So, if we want now to bring it to society, it means that we have to do it in a larger scale. Not just to my friend, not just with my wife, not just with my family, but to a larger scale. Although we have to think first that if it doesn't work in our small unit, like the family, with my children, then will it work in a larger scale? It probably won't. And which means that every theosophist must first test it, first from his own life, then to his immediate surroundings, including his workplace, his profession, then all the organizations that he's involved in, and then to the larger society. Now, in doing this, such a larger scale transformation requires first knowledge, in other words, the key ideas, principles, and then second would be the, the, the practice. And it means that large scale dissemination or widening of such an influence would require mainstreaming. And on the area of practice, large scale practice requires introducing theosophical practices into society, into its institutions, into its customs, traditions, uh, public opinion, public thought. Now, how would we carry out such work? First, let me just touch on what is meant by mainstreaming. Of course, we're familiar with it, but I like the term, the origin of the term, because it speaks about minor rivulets, small streams, as opposed to the mainstream. The mainstream would be something that serves the whole of a civilization, whereas a small rivulet would just be catering to a small group of people. 
and the rest of that civilization will be influenced by other things, other influences. And hence, when we speak about mainstreaming a wisdom, it means that let it be part of the mainstream that will serve the entire civilization, and not just, for example, we, the members of the Theosophical Society, or our own families, but to a wider audience. Now, here are examples of ideas that have mainstreamed, even if the practitioners really are small. For example, Zen. I'm trying to imagine how many real Zen practitioners there are in the world. I think it's very, very small. And yet the idea of Zen practice, the idea that's thought about Zen life has, become, has come to mainstream. It has even been the word Zen has become a very positive word that people wish that they can attain that kind of equanimity of a Zen practitioner. And even if they don't, they have a very good impression of Zen that if they have the opportunity, they will do it. And hence, that thought has become part of our language and our culture. Things like yoga, even a, a system of education like Montessori, among how many educators are there in the world, but how many are there who are Montessori teachers or educators? In terms of percentage, it's very few. Uh, and yet, there is a high level of respect uh, towards the system of education. And if people have the opportunity, they would like to imbibe these principles and apply them. So mainstreaming means first that the concept, the idea, will be part of public thought. And the implementation of these concepts and principles will be a second stage in making a, rea a reality uh, in the lives of people. Now, in looking at the importance of the role of influence or impact, there must be certain ways of measuring them. It is not simply reputation. Something may be very famous and yet not really have an impact on society. For example, in theosophy or the Theosophical Society, is it by membership? I think it would not be, because the Theosophical Society is comparatively such a small organization that if it's measured simply by membership, then it is a non-entity. But like Zen, it is not simply by membership, but something else. Is it measured by books sold or distributed, or by web presence? or by radio or TV broadcasting. There may be so many ways wherein which this kind of dissemination and enlarge, enlarging of its impact or influence uh, will come about. And we'll have to think of ways also of determining whether our work is effective or not. Now let's look at some mathematics of influence. This is true not only to the Theosophical Society, but any movement that believes itself to be, um, to be um, offering something valuable to the world. I'll speak first about the Philippines. The Philippines has a population of about 90, right now it's probably about 96 million, let's say 90 million. And how many babies are born in the Philippines? It's about 1.9 million, or about 2.1% of the population. In other words, every year there are 1,900,000 new individuals, new souls who are born. If that idea, whether it's theosophy or something which is very good, is not influencing 1,900,000 new people every year, either directly or indirectly, then its relative influence is becoming weaker and weaker because the growth of a population outpaces its own influence. Now, if we in the Philippines, we do an average of uh, have lectures with 100 persons, how many are we here? So it's much larger than this group. Let's say 100 persons per lecture. Then we need to give 52 lectures a day for 365 days a year in order to catch up with that population, or that increase in population, but with no repetition. Every person is new in its group. And if you repeat it, two, per, two lectures a year, 
you need 104 lectures a day uh, throughout the year. And if our section reaches only 1,000 new people a year, how many people do we have in lodge meetings and new people in every lodge uh, during the whole year? If we reach 100, 1,000 new people a year, it will take us 1,900 years in order to catch up with that new addition to population of one year. Not a very happy thought, is it? <laughs> and it will take, to catch up with the population addition for 10 years in the Philippines, we will need 19,000 years to catch up if we, if we give this kind, if we just reach 1,000 people a year. All right, let's start about the United States. I just did this when I came over because it's probably more familiar to you rather than the Philippines. So the U.S. population is about 312 million, and there is a population growth of 2,800,000 people a year. In terms of percentage, it's 0.9% per year. We are more than double yours. We are, we are very productive in this area compared to you. <laughs> So 2 million 800 people, and we have to influence 2 million 800 people a year just to catch up. And it means for you 72 lectures a day with 100 people in that audience with no repetition throughout the year, 365 days a year. And it will take you 2,800 years to catch up with the additional population in the U.S. for 10 years, or 28,000 years to catch up for the population for 10 years, 2,800 years for, to catch up with a single year's increase of population. And I don't think that you have that many lecturers, isn't it? Neither do we. And hence, for us to go and reach out, that's not the way. It cannot be done. It is physically impossible. And the nature of influence is not in terms of necessarily direct contact between the originator of an idea and a larger audience. How many Zen practitioners are there, are there? How many real Zen authors? Very few. And yet, how did it spread throughout the world such that people get to know and hear about uh, Zen and they feel inclined to try to embrace it if possible? The quality of influence is important. It is not just reaching out. In other words, if let's say there's one among you, um, where it is the first time that you've heard of theosophy, then if you find that it's nice, then you go home and don't, you don't hear about it for the rest of the year, that kind of an impact will be very shallow and probably by after two days you'll forget about it. And hence, the quality of influence must also be considered. The quality of influence is such that that influence must be relevant and of interest to the person. For without relevance and interest, it will just be a term, and I'll not be involved with it. And what the TS does or teaches must try to catch the attention also of people who can influence other people, whether they are writers, whether they are politicians, whether they are influential people, because this takes the place of quantity. Then. The second important factor is that not only must there be relevance and quality to the conveyance of the message, but there must also be sustenance. It must be continuous and have a permanent effect. It must be reinforced many times a year. Character building, for example, for children cannot be done by just telling the child, you do it this way, this way, that way, and then don't do anything about it for the rest of the year. It must be something that is repetitive, continuous throughout the year. And then to be of real quality, such an influence must affect the life of the individual. So mainstreaming is a long-term work. And now as I share with you some thoughts about this, I'm thinking not in terms of one year or ten years, but in terms of generations. And hence, whatever it is that we may do now regarding this to enhance whatever work we are doing, we probably won't be alive to see the real fruits of it. So the first one is we have to make it 
make the ageless wisdom be part of the public consciousness with a sufficient degree of understanding, even if it's shallow, but a correct level of understanding. Second, the practices of such a philosophy must be introduced so that it will form the worldview, especially of young people, and will affect the customs, traditions, legislation, politics, religions of society. And the third is that in order to do this, every organization or movement that espouses to do so must internally be prepared. There must be a culture among those who espouse, and there must be active, active advocates who are well trained to do so. So the first one is about the name and the reputation itself. This is in itself shallow, but is an important ingredient in the work that will follow. Because the greatest obstacle to a movement or organization can often be its own reputation. Something may be very wholesome, and yet because of, of some quirks of fate, of some quirks of the media, then it got a very bad press wrongly, then it stops its good work because people will tend to be turned away will be turned off and they will turn away when they hear the name. And hence, it is also important for us in the Theosophical Society that the term Theosophy or the Theosophical Society should be correctly conveyed what it, it, it stands for, what its meaning is, correctly conveyed to society in general. Whether they'll be interested or not is another matter, but at least there would be no misconception or um, misunderstanding as to what it is. When I was a new theosophist, after I became a member, I would hear in the Philippines radio programs which associated theosophy with a lot of cults. And in the Philippines, it's 85% or 95% Christian, 85% Catholic. And so they tend to be very allergic to new movements, especially Eastern movements. And so theosophy became classed with it. Now this shifted when we published a public magazine called the Theosophical Digest. This was done more than 20 years ago. And it contained very practical uh, articles about living, character development, comparative religion, Christianity, uh, spirituality, mysticism, such that one of the things that we noted was instead of, be of being shunned by the religious people, the Christians in the Philippines, one of our favorite sub subscribers would be people from the convents and the seminaries, those who take the spiritual life seriously, because it seems that they found that the, our publication, the Theosophical Digest, met a need of theirs because there is not a mystical magazine at all in the whole of the Philippines. Apparently, we met that need, and they, I remember one nun, we, we, our headquarters is in a street called Ebay Street, which is very, very long, stretching to, I don't know, 10 blocks or more. And it is number one Ebay Street. We are number one. And she thought she will quickly find our place. She started at the wrong end <laughs> and had to walk the entire, I don't know how many blocks, until she, she reached the very end of Ebay Street, which is number one. And that's uh, that's uh, when she found the headquarters and renewed her subscription. She just wanted to renew her subscription of the magazine. So apparently, theosophy met certain deep needs of religious and spiritual organizations. And after that, we tried to, we tried to meet a wider need of the spiritual and religious yearnings of people to a wider audience. Now, I just want to ask a few questions. You don't have to answer me, but mm -hmm. think about it. What is your impression of an organization like Opus Dei? It's quite active in the Philippines. I see some of you shaking your heads. Now, there are uh, very positive views about this, but there are also very negative views about this. And what's this novel? Um, the Vinci Code was no help at all, <laughs> isn't it? And that really affected the worldwide reputation just because of one book, and it happened to be a bestseller. If it's something, an obscure book, it doesn't matter, but it is not. So 
it did affect the perception of people on an organization, rightly or wrongly. Hare Krishna, the Masons, the Mormons, Zen, Taliban of Afghanistan. So you will notice that we go by initial impressions. We may not understand very well what the Opus Dei people believe in or do, or the Mormons, but if we heard something about them, it will determine whether we are going to become interested and go t towards them and study what they're teaching or not, or shy away from them. If they are active in something, it makes us decide whether we'll help them or we oppose them. So, most names, whether individuals or movements or philosophies, are associated with one or two key ideas. And it's because people cannot handle complex ideas for many people or things because there are just too many individuals, churches, uh, historical figures, movements, philosophies, and other things. There are so many of them that we may have good impressions of a few of them, deep understanding, but most of them is just initial impressions. Now, what is theosophy to most people? Many of us here have been familiar with theosophy, so we probably have a good idea. But we are a very small percentage of the whole world. What do people think about theosophy or the theosophical society? Is it something like a new age something? Something which is teaching reincarnation, psychic phenomena, Buddhism, occult, philosophy, Hinduism, intellectuals, magic, esotericism. In some places, people think of the Theosophical Society, at least in the Philippines, as highly intellectual people. They keep on discussing and discussing abstruse things, and they sometimes feel turned, turned off by what lodges do. Okay. And those impressions will last, oftentimes, a lifetime. Now, or are we associated with the concept of universal brotherhood, religious unity, peace, charitable activities, meditation, spirituality, religious unity? Now, if the idea of people about theosophy is mysterious or abstruse, is it because that's what we intended, or is it by default? In other words, it's because that's what people say, rightly or wrongly, uh, but that's how people remember us for. Then secondly, is that association positive or negative? Do people feel guarded when they hear about it, or they feel, do they feel comfortable about it? Do they welcome it, or do they resist it? Now, as those who are sympathetic towards theosophy or the theosophical society, we must take part in making this this word, this concept of this, or this, uh, the name of the organization, something which is accurately reflected in the minds of people, so that it doesn't suffer from misimpression and wasteful or unnecessary barriers to its proper understanding. Now, what do you think would be two or three key words that we would like to be associated with in the public mind. There's something that perhaps we should look into. And once we have arrived at a consensus on this, then we must actively be active in bringing it uh, to, the, to the arena of public opinion. Here are some examples of what we might wish to be associated with. For example, is it universal brotherhood? There are advantages to it uh, because it's the first object. But the disadvantage is that it's a masculine-sounding term. How about sisterhood? <laughs> and also it's silent about the wisdom, which is one of the strong things that theosophy offers. Call it age ageless wisdom. That's good because it is the core of theosophy. But it's also vague because wisdom is a very vague word. And ancient or ageless is even more vague. Suppose we say it's, uh, the Theosophical Society is about religious unity. That's good because it's relevant to present problems, but some people would tend to think that we agree with all religions and try to say that, all right, let's all get together, and which may not be a right perception. 
Then we can go on into character building, which is a very wholesome thing, but that's only a facet. Or spirituality, which is part of theosophical life and practice, but what, how does it differ from other religious movements? Then on meditation, it is an essential practice, but again, it's just a facet. Now, people won't remember all these things, but only a few of them. Which ones would we put on the front so that people, if they do remember us, would have a rather good impression of what theosophy really is and what the work of the Theosophical Society is? This is something which I would suggest that all Theosophical groups, sections, lodges, should think about because when we advertise, then we are putting to the front those key ideas. And if they see the advertisement only once, that's what they will remember us for. So what is that that we'd like to be remembered for? So if we have done that, and that's, I think, a process wherein which it will take a long time for us to have a consensus about, we go to the next level, which is now uh, not just being worried about how we are known for, but the quality of the impact of such a wisdom on society. So it's about practice. The Theosophical Society would like the wisdom to be an influence to individuals and society. And to do so, such a long-term influence must be accomplished, uh, accomplished through regular practice. Not a belief, but a way of life. A belief, uh, a, a person can believe anything and yet live differently. And hence, that such an impact when it is just intellectual would not really be going to the roots. And hence, if we wish to be part of the influence to society, we must look into the arena of practice. For example, uh, I grew up as a Catholic, and in the Philippines, it's really dominating uh, culture, um, worldview. But as I studied very deeply Catholicism, I've become, I become convinced that the strength of the Catholic Church is not because of its dogma. There are a lot of things, after I studied the dogmas of Catholicism, that I couldn't put together, I couldn't piece together, because many of them are contradictory. There are many doctrines in the past centuries which the Catholic Church had abrogated, changed, uh, felt embarrassed about, and yet, with all these contradictions, why is it so powerful, so strong? It's because of its institutions, of the way that it, it embeds in social practice uh, its worldview, its way of life, its belief systems. And in that way, wherever it is active, it standardizes such a worldview among those that are within its scope. It is being done through the weekly church gatherings, through the schools and universities worldwide, through its many religious orders, charities, activities, uh, youth programs, and so on. The educational system of the Catholic Church is the biggest private school system in the world, next to governments. Whether it is here in the United States, or the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, you have so many Catholic colleges and universities here in the United States, the biggest private school system, more than any other, more so in the Philippines. We have four top universities in the Philippines, the best ones. Three of them are Catholic universities. The oldest one is older than Harvard University. The leaders of the Philippines, whether they become president, senators, congressmen, judges, they come from oftentimes these four. And whatever values they imbibe in their growing up period, whether in the church or in the schools, they carry this throughout their life. And what they do later in life will be influenced by, by how they are brought up in these institutions and practices. This is the reason why any kind of philosophy that we believe to be right, it must be introduced as a workable practice in the institutions, in the customs and traditions and cultures of people. The Theosophical Society then must actively help in making the principles of the ageless wisdom 
become a living part of current institutions, practices, and even customs. It is not simply by speeches, because whatever you hear, it will be worked out by the mind, but not necessarily by our habit and our daily practice. Now, let me just backtrack a bit and then look at some of the most influential theosophists in history. Uh, they are, I think, Blavatsky, Henry Alcott, Annie Besant, J. Krishnamurti. And probably the m most influential is the third one, Annie Besant. All of them were involved in mainstreaming process. Blavatsky in the arena of world thought. She really was the person responsible for implanting modern theosophical ideas in world thought, engaging everybody in any kind of debate or discussion in journals uh, or books about what theosophy is in relation to culture, uh, religion, science, or philosophies. Henry Alcott, on the other hand, was the person who has established the most schools, theosophical schools, compared to anybody in all of theosophical history. In, in Sri Lanka alone, if I'm not mistaken, he established 229 schools there. But later, uh, the Theosophical Society turned this over to the government so that there's not a single Theosophical school left uh, in Sri Lanka. In fact, it's the same thing which was done in India, where Ani Besant, Alcott, and other people established Theosophical schools. By 1985, only one was left because most of them were turned over to others. So um, these schools, while some of them retain the name Theosophical, they are, not, they are no longer really theosophical schools. They're just standard schools. Annie Besant, for example, was a great advocate of the mainstreaming process. It was during her term that the Theosophical Society became most famous in the world. And she established many schools and colleges. She founded two newspapers, launched subsidiary organizations such as the Theosophical Order of Service. She entered politics, wrote many books. She was a uh, she was one of the great figures in Indian movement towards independence, towards uh, freedom from the British rule. Then, uh, as I said, the apex of theosophical influence peaked during her time. The membership in the TS was highest during her time. But the saddest part is that much of her great work faded after her death. For example, by 1985, only one school was left, Alcott Memorial School, in India. Now, unfortunately, something sad, but it's true, we are now often regarded as something on the sidelines rather than in the mainstream. I once read in one minor encyclopedia about the Theosophical Society. Whenever I see any encyclopedia, I would go to T and look at Theosophical Society. And in this minor encyclopedia, it speaks as if the Theosophical Society does not exist anymore because it's no longer visible. So that's one example of a public perception of what Theosophical work does. Now, in trying to bring this to society, it is not us ourselves which will do so, but rather by the multiplier effect, by introducing something which is wholesome and relevant then people will do it by themselves, and then it will propagate by itself when it's something that is relevant and holds. So what activities and programs or publications have the highest effective impact on the public in terms of quantity and self-transformative effect or the quality? Now, as I mentioned, such an influence must be a regenerative thing, something which is repeatedly done and not just a, a one-shot something. And in a letter of the Mahatmas, by Mahatma K.H., in a letter to Hume, he says that whatever helps restore that higher standard of thought and morals must be a regenerating national force. I've been intrigued very much because the Mahatma letters speak about this word regeneration repeatedly. And I realized that it is something which is very important to grasp because the introduction 
of anything that will transform life must be something that is refreshed every day. My relationship with my wife or children is not when we sign a marriage contract and say that we are now married, husband and wife, and after that, I take her for granted. It must not be like that. I must regenerate this relationship every day for the rest of our lives. My relationship with my children, my whatever habits, whatever, whatever way of life I do, must be something that must be regenerated every day. Habits are habits because they have been regenerated every day until they really uh, stop, and then it became a permanent part of our habits. So I'll just share some thoughts about areas which we are already doing or which we can do, but perhaps which, we, which can be expanded in order to do a wider arena of benefit. One of them would be, would be uh, publications, because these are things that people would pass from one person to the other. It can be magazines, it can be newspapers, and it can be read repeatedly. Now, unfortunately, today, I think that there are not more than three public magazines in the Theosophical Society. Uh, the rest are magazines for members, which means that it caters to an in audience, an in crowd, rather than the general public, which means that we are not bringing the message of the wisdom to a larger audience. I believe that we should do more uh, in, this, in this respect. Uh, I wonder whether you know what is the biggest magazine in the world? What is the circulation? What is the most widely circulated magazine in the world? Any idea? No, it used to be before, but now no more. It's not even al among the top anymore. Playboy. Playboy? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is a religious magazine. Catholic, No. Yes. Another watchtower. Yes, the Watchtower. And you know how, how much they print each year? Uh, no, not each year, but each issue. It's a monthly magazine. Guess. Two million? It's 44 million. They print 44 million, and the circulation is about 22 million or more. It's, and they, I, it, it seems that they keep in store more than 17 million copies which they usually give away. Now, I don't know whether you'd like to keep 17 million copies of Quest magazine in your warehouse every month. <laughs> but they do. They do. And not only that, but they, the second biggest circulating magazine in the world comes from the same religion. It is a magazine called Awake, and they uh, print and, and circulate about 21 million copies. Now, and yet, not many people hear about this, isn't it? Only those who happen to encounter it, because it's not a magazine which is for sale in, in, the, in the newsstands. And so even with uh, such a huge, uh, a widely circulating magazine, it's not even mainstream. So uh, this issue about mainstream is not a very easy thing to tackle. And hence, it must be done in the most effective and efficient way. So here is an area that we are already doing something about, but we have to do on a wider scale. The second one would be the, the TV, uh, <coughs> even uh, web TV, and so on. And the only one doing this on a large scale is Brazil. And they're doing it in a magnificent way, uh, but rather expensive way. And yet, I've seen in the Philippines many small religious groups that have their own channels in mainstream television. Amazing what they can do. And oftentimes, to my mind, what they, what they often advocate is not something which is, to my mind, very wholesome. And I would wish that somebody who would be, um, well, movements that are really very wholesome would have those uh, opportunities for widening their influence. Now here is, uh, when I went to Taiwan last time, I saw that there is a Buddhist newspaper. And uh, I read some Mandarin, and they just contain very wholesome interviews, news, and so on. And it's a daily newspaper. Uh, 
so that's something that Annie Besant tried to do, although in the area of politics uh, during her time. But here is an attempt to influence the entire city and culture uh, where it is being published. Now, I'd like to touch on youth development and character building. Uh, I, and I was, I was preparing this and I thought of coconut trees. You know, coconut trees grow like that, straight, tall, beautiful. But when they are young, they can grow in a crooked way, in a distorted way. And after they have grown mature, you cannot change it anymore. And the world is like that. How we influence the character of young people after they have already solidified, then when they have already become adults, it's very hard to change. Here is, are some examples of uh, coconut trees which have been bent when they were still young. And that is an example where due to typhoon, then they bend in one direction. They try to go up, but typhoons keep on blowing them to, to bend in a certain direction. Here is another one. <laughs> While it was young, then it was bent one way or the other and grew up like that. You try to change and straighten it, you're going to break it. And here is another example. Here. I don't know how this coconut tree grew like that, but it became like that when it was a young coconut tree, not when it has become an adult. And it emphasizes the need for our work in character building, character development among the young. And uh, because of this, I'm convinced that we must devote a lot of our efforts and resources uh, to young people. Right now, I think the majority of the worldwide effort in the Theosophical Society is addressed towards adults and not towards the young. But even if you have a certain percentage of adults who have imbibed this, one of these days they'll be gone. And then this new generation will now take over and the whole culture becomes different because we did not even address this younger generation. So I believe that education is an important direction of the work that we should do. It's a difficult work, I know, because um, that's one reason why there are many theosophical schools which were established but which were closed afterwards because it's very hard to maintain. But nevertheless, if it's something worthwhile doing, then I believe it should be done even at the risk of failure. In the Philippines, we tried this, and we have now four schools, and we're going to open another one uh, next year for a fifth school. And it starts from kindergarten up to college level. The, the largest is this one, Golden Link College, which offers five bac baccalaureate degrees uh, in education, in psychology, in business administration, and, and in information technology. But what's the difference between that and any other college which offers the same thing? We introduce and make part of the entire curriculum, the theosophical element of education, for example, we cannot use fear as a way of motivating children. We, cannot, we don't use contests or competition because competition would be something which would encourage talented people but would discourage people who are not that talented. They would feel inferior. So what do we do? When we have a program like, let's say, um, let's say declamation program, public speaking program, we don't just choose, like in most schools, we don't just choose the best ones to go to the stage and go into a contest of public speaking contest or uh, speech contest, we don't do that. But rather, we ask every student, from three-year-old nursery student up to the oldest college student, to go to the stage one by one and deliver a speech. And we have 500 students in this school. It takes us three to four days to finish the program. Not three hours, but three to four days. And the teachers take turn in watching when the elementary school teachers watch the elementary program. The high school teachers watch the high school program. I, as the head, I have to sit through, all, sit through all the three days or four days of programs. But it's something which is very worthwhile because it changes the self-image, the attitude, the outlook of the individual when they are appreciated and they are able to become what they can become and be appreciated and be challenged to do public speaking. Um, somebody said 
in one of our sessions that the number one fear of people is public speaking. This is true. And yet, here in this school, we often do this. Like, suppose we have a program like this, and there are students sitting around. We would then just say, all right, maybe some, some of you students would like to come up and say something about maybe a certain topic. And many of them would do that unprepared because they did not experience the, the uh, humiliation, you know, being jeered at or being, being uh, laughed at. And at the same time, they know that in other schools where they ca came from, there is such. And yet they have learned that it's all right to just say your thoughts and accept yourself as you are. And in that way, a person can become the best that one can be without fear of being talked about or criticized by other people. Self-esteem and self-acceptance is a very important foundation for the education of the young. So this would be what theosophical education would offer in addition to teaching theosophy itself. All our college students go through a, a one-semester course of theosophy. Then they go through a one-semester course of self-transformation, which is on self-management, emotional management, and so on. And then they have to learn comparative religion. And then all education students go through a one-semester course on theosophical education, and so on. So these are the elements that we introduce to make it a theosophical school. There is no punishment. We don't expel students. And we don't have, um, we have a very, a very small uh, occurrence of what might be called problem students. Um, that's the term of other schools. Even though we accept expelled students from up to three schools, they're not accepted anymore in other schools, we accept them. And yet within one semester, within that environment, they really change. The bullies stop being bullies. They become responsible young people. It's something very exciting. It's something that is so fulfilling. And as I go to this school twice a week, I, I once mentioned to Tim that this place is one of the happiest places I go to. It's something which when I go there, uh, young people, will, uh, the, the students would smile and greet me and shake my hands. I shake one to two hundred hands when, each day when I go there. There is something in the atmosphere that makes the community something which uh, is ideal in terms of relationship. It's not that we are so lax that they are so happy with the teachers because there's no discipline. No. But it's more in the relationship and in the environment. And I, I hope that 50 or 100 years from now, we can do what, like what the Catholic Church is doing, really spreading the educational institutions all over the world and create an impact on young people while they are young. Then youth centers. This is something that we are just starting to do in the Philippines, and I hope that it can be done elsewhere. Youth centers can be a small place, even as big as this one, but a place where there's a library, there are activities. You can even tutor them, help them, counsel them. Uh, in the Philippines, I think also in the United States, many young people have a lot of free time every day. In the Philippines, Half of the day of public school students, they're off from school. What do they do? They either go to the computer shops playing computer games or go with groups and then be influenced one way or the other. But if we have such a youth center, which is interesting, relevant, and challenging, and then they may come. And we may, even if they're not students of our school, we may influence them permanently in their growing up process or youth camps together with the youth centers. This is something which we've been doing for about 15 years or more. And it has such a great impact. We called it Golden Link Youth Camps. It had such an impact in four days' time that we decided to put up a school called Golden Link School, which led to the Golden Link College. So just four days out of 365 days, we realized how powerful an environment can be in the changing of the lives of young people. This is an example of what the government asked us to do. We conducted these youth camps to government officials who are young. In the Philippines, you know, you have city councils in the Philippines, but in, the, in, in all over the world, city councils, town councils, state uh, assembly. In the Philippines, there's an additional council for young people, and they're elected, and they are officials of the government, and they are up to, I think, 18 years old. 
they are learning how to be leaders. They're being trained. But what happens is that they are being nurtured in traditional politics, which includes corruptions or things that are not very nice in, in politics. And hence, as a way to counteract it, we have been asked to conduct youth camps to these officials. And oftentimes, in entire provinces, all the leaders would convene, and then we conduct it for four days. These are seminars for faculties of colleges and universities. This photo is one for, for a Catholic school. And these are the teachers. Because the lady on my left side is a principal. She is a nun. And then she had, she had heard about this. She had read a book. And then she felt that this is what she needed in her school. Despite the fact that it's a very Catholic institution, but they did not feel at all threatened by the fact that this being done by the Theosophical Society. And that's the reason why I feel that when theosophy is rightly perceived by the public, it will not be perceived as a threat at all by any religion. It's because of misperceptions, and partly that's our responsibility to create a right perception. It's partly of, due to misperceptions that we tend to be, people tend to be guarded when they hear of the word theosophy or the theosophical society. So this is a government school where they ask us to conduct seminars for their own students. And in this particular case, the, the faculty in charge of student affairs was not sure what the Theosophical Society is, aside from what she heard from a fellow, a, a colleague. So she just um, arranged for a group of students. They had, I think, about 3,000 students. And after the session, this, after the seminar, she said, I should have... I should have convened the entire school, not just these students. So we do have a message, and this message is non-sectarian. It is something that people find relevant, and it has a very, very noble and worthwhile uh, uh, function or effect on people, young or adult. And I think we just need to uh, create more opportunities of reaching out to a wider audience. Uh, this one is probably not being done by many, but we just, I'm just adding it because we happen to open a vegetarian store. I mean, the Theosophical Society started a vegetarian store in the headquarters, and it's not even finished in painting, and yet they decided to launch it. And it opened about three days before I came over to the United States. And this is the inside of the, of the restaurant. I took photos of this before I left. And it's something which is another effort of the Theosophical Society to bring practices to society, which is vegetarianism. And uh, because we, are, we found ourselves in the middle of a commercial area, so there are many people who would be potential clients not only of the food but of the bookstore, which is just right next to the vegetarian uh, restaurant. It's an interesting and challenging thing. We know that it may not really work. It may fail. But it doesn't matter. Is it something worthwhile? Then let's do it. Then there are many other areas, social service, orphanage, animal clinic, medical mission, counseling, relief operations. Whatever um, society, government, churches, movements do, it's something that we must do, we can do also. So many more. But what's the difference between what we do and what the government or other uh, social organizations do? It is the theosophical element. And what would be those theosophical elements? One of them would be anything which would foster unity or universal oneness, universal brotherhood. I believe that would be theosophical work. Even if we don't say a word about astral bodies or about uh, reincarnation, if it's something that fosters unity, then it's theosophical work. Compassion and benevolence. I'm reminded of what the Dalai Lama said. My religion is compassion. And anybody who is compassionate, we have the same religion. Then selflessness, because selfishness is the problem of the world. Then character building, especially for the young. Spirituality and wisdom. So anything that contains all of these things, I believe, would be a theosophical work. It's not just, it's not just lodge meetings where we study theosophy from chapter 1 to chapter 10, but rather a way of life. Now, the third part, which I'd like to uh, round up this uh, sharing uh, with, 
is on self-preparation. All these things are nice, but it requires absolutely one requisite, which is our own self-preparedness. If we do expand our public work, we must ensure that we ourselves are ready. If not, it will backfire. If, for example, theosophy becomes so well known that people are calling up uh, every state of the U.S. to ask about this, and you happen to have a lodge whose concept of theosophy is weird or queer, and then they encounter this, they'll just have the, wrong, the, the wrongest impressions of theosophy. It happened to us in the Philippines that we had to hibernate a, a, a lodge in the Philippines because of this. The leader of that had a queer concept about what theosophy is, and it really created a very widespread misimpression of what theosophy is. It was doing a disservice, so we had to hibernate that group. So our lodges and branches prepared to entertain in an effective way the inquiries, visitors' interest that may be generated. Now, organizations are really about people. It's not about the building. It's not about the money. It's not about the books. It's about people all the time. It is people who explain, who model, who implement, who live, who demonstrate, who execute everything that is part of that philosophy in order to make that philosophy a reality. And therefore, there are two factors in such internal preparation. The first is that it must create its own culture. When we speak about Zen culture, more or less we have an idea about what a Zen practitioner is in his way of life. A Carmelite nun, more or less you have an idea about what a Carmelite nun would do. Uh, so such a movement would have its own culture. Now, do we have such a theosophical culture? Maybe yes, but maybe no. Sometimes because of our autonomy, our freedom of thought, um, we tend to be a bit wary that we try to have some kind of a kind of a standard. But at the same time, if theosophy has a wholesome message, and that message is different from other ways of life, then that message, when applied, becomes our culture. For example, we don't have a culture of violence. In fact, the opposite, a culture of oneness. So that's part of our culture. So what are those qualities we would like to encourage among us? Every lodge and every section, or every sphere, every school, institution that is uh, within the theosophical scope, what kind of culture do we want to have in those areas? The second one is that we have to have a group of advocates who would responsibly and competently espouse that to a wider audience, even those who are not theosophists. So even if sections are autonomous, there must be some kind of a consensus about what we'd like to be as theosophists. And second, or otherwise, the public would be confused because we ourselves are a bit confused about what, do we really, what kind of a life do we really want to live. Now, it takes decades to nurture such a theosophical way of life and develop qualified advocates. And to sustain this, we must go into a system, a procedure, such that the enculturation process, meaning if I become a new participant, not necessarily a member, maybe I'm attending all these talks, this enculturation process must be part of the, of the, of the whole system. In other words, it is something that is regenerating, something continuous, and not just a one-shot thing. And the training of advocates must also become part of the system. It is, we have learned a lot of lessons in our work in the Theosophical Society in the Philippines. In the many decades in the past, when you have a very dynamic leader, then it peaks. After the, the, the leader dies, then it fades. Then it goes into hibernation for a period, then another dynamic leader, then it goes up, and then when the person retires or goes away, it goes down. This is not a very good system of sustaining good work. Rather, it must not depend on the leader. The whole culture itself must be able to self-perpetuate. Imagine a school which only depends upon a good principle. Then it will close when there's no good principle. It, it doesn't work that way. The system itself must be able to perpetuate the culture, the, the way of life. So 
These are very large and long-term work, and let me just summarize the three things. The first is that we must identify in what way we'd like to be identified with what key concepts or ideas to the public mind, because this would be the first barrier or help in our attempt to bring the practice and the philosophy to the fabric of human society. Second, there must be a continuing active effort among us theosophists to bring these practices into the fabric of society. And the third is that we must nurture a culture, first among our members and sympathizers, and then among our advocates. And that this enculturation and training must also be sustained by making that as part of the program, like an institute, an institution. And this cannot be done by any single person or group. It must be done by all of us. They require synergy. And every time I come here to the US or to Brazil or to the other section, one of the most valuable things I treasure is the opportunity to work with many of you so that we can work together. And if we find that this is really noble work, then let us do so together rather than do it separately as if we are individual islands not caring about each other. So we must do it cooperatively and synergize. And then we must do it with determination. If the, if the value is clear, if the objective is clear, then it will take a long, long time. We may not even see the fruit. But if you really like an apple tree and you have an apple seed planted, and nurture it while it's young, and you're sure, even if you don't see it, if you die in the meantime, you'll know that what will appear there will not be a mango tree or a, an orange tree, but an apple tree. And hence, if you are sure about the seeds, what kind of seeds we have at which we would like to plant, we don't have to see its fruits. It will grow to that kind of a fruit so long as we are sure what kind of fruit we'd like. And hence, even if it takes generations, decades, or even centuries, our task is simply to plant the right seed, to sow the right seed. If we sow the wrong seeds, let's be inactive. <laughs> Let us not do anything else because we are adding to the problems of the world. And this is the reason why theosophy, the philosophy, must always be tested in our own lives, in our own groups, in our family. And then we see that it's really a wholesome seed. And then let's be active in planting it. And such a decision, such a determination, will determine the fate and future destiny of the entire Theosophical Society and our role in trying to make this world a better place. Good evening to all of you. I want to thank you, Vic. Um, you're open to take some questions, yes. I assume? A yes. uh, very challenging presentation. and. Uh, any questions that you might have or comments would certainly be welcome at this time. We have something from the web already, so maybe, James, you could read that one. Uh, f from David on the Internet, how do you think we should handle bad press? I believe we should be active in the right press. Uh, there are many organizations who are passive when it comes to public, public relations. And if, uh, if the wrong perceptions circulate, it will be partly the responsibility of that person or organization because he had been silent and he doesn't say the right things. So I think the answer to bad press is right press. Not necessarily good press. I, I mean, sometimes good press means trying to sugarcoat what we are. But then that's not, in the long term, a good thing, because we should be what we are. In other words, let them know what we are. Is it for universal brotherhood? Let them know it is. If they disagree with it, let them disagree with it. But we try not to quote it in such a way that it will look nice when we're actually not that. So we try to circulate as widely as possible the things that we truly represent the way of life. And I believe that there's nothing that we need to even be embarrassed or hide about. So let this be the things that will be known as widely as possible. Then we are helping counter, uh, counteract what is called bad press. 
we just correct the misimpression. When Madame Lubatsky got a very bad press from the British Society of Psychical Research, it really devastated the society. But that was just a period of town, and with sufficient recirculation of the right information, the Theosophical Society not only recovered, but increased during the time of Annie Besant. So I'm not too worried about temporary bad press. What I'm worried about is whether we are doing something which is not right, then we should worry about that. But if we are doing something which is right, eventually it will prevail. It's not just about the Theosophical Society, but rather any movement which espouses this, a similar view. We should join hands with them in order to espouse this and make this a part of so, the social fabric of you know, practice, customs, traditions, and public opinion. Any more questions? Janet? Dan's closer. <clears throat> um, in, your, in your work with the, uh, with the schools, with the young children, um, how much do you work with parents, too? Because I would think that affects some of the character-based uh, uh, training you want to give them. Yes, very much. What we did at the beginning was every the beginning of the school year, we have a parents' parenting seminar where we invite all the parents to come and have a one-day seminar. But we notice that parents don't attend, and you cannot force them to attend. And so it wasn't working very well. So what we did is this. We have seven programs throughout the year where we invite parents, because the programs would involve you know, singing, speeches, performances of their children, and usually a lot of them come. And it is during these programs where we have, at the end, always a session for parents. Um, we speak about parenting, about relationship, about anger, about love, about communication, about values, about you know, uh, development or the nurturing of young people. So every year we have those six or seven occasions where we talk to them about this, and that's how we do it. In addition to that, Three times a year, we meet individually with parents. The teachers would talk individually to parents. And this will take a few days about the development of their children, problems with their children, opportunities, talents, and so on. So we do that. This is a very important factor because when the home and the school uh, are in conflict, there is a problem. The child gets confused. He hears one thing at home and hears another in, in the school. And when they like the school better, uh, the parents become, what do you call it, like uh, they, they become co co contravida. What is contravida in English? In other words, uh, the villains. They become the villains in their lives uh, because the, the teachers are very kind to them and the parents have conflicting behaviors, attitudes, and then they begin to not have very good feelings towards the parents. We don't want that, because the parents should be the primary influence in the life of young people. So we would like this to be integrated. This is something very important. Yes, Janet. Early on, you spoke about the idea of developing two or three core concepts about theosophy and the Theosophical Society yes. that we could present to the public and that should be the first things they think of when that they associate with us. How do we go about developing those and, and coming to terms, coming to agreement on how to present ourselves? I, I, I really appreciated your comments about the term brotherhood, for example, because much as I love the concept, I have a real problem with the term. And yes. I would like to find another word for that. All right. Siblinghood? <laughs> well, it's a real... When I was in Cortona, we talked about this. And we got stuck with a lot of problems with words. Words, 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 that in one culture, it's nice. In another culture, it's not nice. The word occultism is okay in India, but it's not nice in many Christian countries. The word brotherhood is not a problem in many Asian countries, but it is a problem in many Western countries. So we are dealing with perceptions. And in another generation or century, 
the situations may change, and the way that we would uh, disseminate something would may be different. And therefore, it's important for different cultures to decide in what way those key concepts or ideas should be couched. Secondly, what are those key ideas? So it would be good for the Theosophical Society in general, Theosophists, to sit together and say, all right, who are we really? And if there's, there are two or three thoughts, concepts, or words that would best represent the Theosophical Society and Theosophy, what would this be? And if we come to a consensus, then we, the, the concerted efforts of our work will now focus on those when it comes to public work. Like, I saw a, uh, an advertisement of Crotona in their local magazine, very beautiful advertisement, co full colored. And in that one fourth page advertisement, it just had two phrases, two phrases. Whatever those two phrases are, that's the intended message to a general public who's just scanning through the magazine, oh, the Crotona Institute of Theosophy, and these two phrases. Oh, so this is what they do, or what they are. Then they go elsewhere. That impression will stick. So we must, there is nothing in our objects that would tell us that we should focus on this and that, aside from universal brotherhood. But aside from universal brotherhood or sisterhood, is there something else, like wisdom or peace or uh, spirituality or what? And then the simple public expression or dissemination of what theosophy and the theosis would now carry these messages. When they become, when they feel that oh, this is something that I'm interested in, then they go to the second and third level of their uh, familiarization or acquaintanceship with theosophy. Then we can now give them the more complex ideas. As they go deeper and deeper, then it really becomes, they go to the root of the study. But for the majority, 99% of the public. It will just be the surface name and association.